Hello, my name is Jennifer McNeil. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for NFI's North American Bus and Coach business, including New Flyer and MCI. Today, it's my privilege to welcome Mr. Paul Scatellis, the President and CEO of the American Public Transportation Association, or APTA, for a chat about some of the most critical issues faced today by public transit agencies in the United States. In addition to his role leading APTA, Paul brings a wealth of transportation experience, having led transit agencies in Pittsburgh and Orlando, as well as an executive role in WSP, one of the world's largest architectural and engineering firms. Thank you for joining us today, Paul. Well, Jennifer, it's my pleasure. It's great to see you and, and to be with you today. So first of all, I want to say congratulations and thank you. 2021 was another extremely challenging year for public transit and APTA's relentless advocacy for both COVID relief funding and the new surface transportation bill has been absolutely incredible. So I thought I'd start out by asking you a few questions about the historic $1.2 trillion Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It's now been approved and it will be funding transit for the next five years. So what does it mean to the transit industry in the United States to have this funding in place? And how do you think that the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act differs from its predecessor, the FAST Act? And what do you think that will, will mean in terms of change for, for public transit in the United States? Well, Jennifer, I will say first, it is very hard to overstate how important this new funding and legislation is for our public transportation industry. Thank you first for acknowledging uh, the good work of APTA. And I must say, it really has been a collective effort of our association, our industry, uh, that's comprised of both the private sector that New Flyer certainly is part of, uh, as well as our public sector members. And together, we've worked hard now for several years uh, to attain what was passed in November by Congress and signed by the president. Uh, uh, it is a game changer, without any doubt. This is uh, the largest amount of federal funding for public transportation in the history of the public transit program at the national level in the U.S. So we are both excited by this and really eager to begin this process of investing in our transportation system and beginning to make the kinds of improvements that all of us have envisioned for many, many years. Uh, you might know I've been in the industry for, for a long time and and, and with my colleagues have really worked very hard over the years to get public transit investment to some kind of a parity level relative to the surface transportation programs, mainly our highway program. And while we perhaps haven't achieved quite that, uh, nevertheless, this is a robust funding, some $40 billion additional funding over the baseline. So in the course of the next five years, our public transportation industry will have about $108 billion to invest in our public transportation systems. A big emphasis on buses, a big emphasis on uh, making the kinds of investments to replace aging bus fleets, which is certainly a priority for our members, large and small, all across the country. Uh, and beyond that, uh, providing an emphasis really for uh, taking us into the future with low to no emission of bus fleets as well. So there's a specific emphasis and monies. In fact, depending on how you look at the funds, it's at least a doubling, perhaps a tripling of the amount of money that will go into bus replacement uh, and really an emphasis on low to no emission vehicles, which again is part of what our agenda is, part of the national agenda now for public transportation. So it's an exciting time. The resources will be forthcoming. And our agencies now are busy looking at their programs and what they can afford to do and the timelines to do them. Uh, but I will say uh, there's no question uh, that this is a major change for the industry. Uh, the industry is ready to step up to begin this, this investment. I've also been really encouraged by the funding set aside for things like charging infrastructure. I think that's been a, um, a bit of a, a obstacle to, to adoption. And so really, really excited about some of the new funding programs coming through. Well, you know, if I may comment on that, there's no doubt that that's, that's a part of the puzzle here that our agencies in particular, as they look at what they can afford to do, uh, have been challenged with. We know that this is a relatively newer set of technologies that always take time to work out the details, to improve the technology. Uh, and that's happening. Uh, that's the good news part of it. But we also know that the agencies have to be prudent in terms of their investments. They're looking at the capital cost of acquisition for the vehicles. They're looking at the infrastructure cost 
to support them, the charging that you reference, all of these go into the decision making that the agencies will have to make. And now they have the kind of resources available to them that they can begin to do that. One of the key elements is this notion of not just buying an electric vehicle and testing it and seeing if it works into the fleet at some point, but really doing it with a plan to make a transition. So the agencies now are required to do these zero emission transition plans, which really provide some uh, roadmap going forward, how they will begin to test these technologies and begin to grow their fleets as they uh, work towards a no emission uh, fleet in the future. Really exciting. So let's talk a little bit about ridership throughout the U.S. and over the last couple of years. Um, there has really been a dramatic uh, reduction in ridership, um, you know, in kind of the, the main um, uh, impact of it. We saw ridership down by as much as 80 percent. With vaccine rollouts, return to the office initiatives, cities opening up, a bit of tourism and travel recovering. How are transit agencies recovering from the, those lows of the pandemic? And how do they measure success in a post-COVID world? Um, I think we have proven that public transit is an essential service, and it's not necessarily just about ridership numbers. Can you, can you speak a little bit to the recovery of public transit? You know, we are now into the third calendar year of this pandemic, a full two years, really, since the onset of COVID-19. Uh, the effects, as you've uh, referenced, have been devastating, really, across many sectors. So we're not alone in this. This the economy was shut down. Uh, we stayed at home. People weren't traveling, fearful for their health for good reason. Um, all the vaccines that have been developed now that uh, many people, millions of people have taken advantage of. But we've seen an environment, certainly, where, where public transportation hasn't been able really to get back to where anywhere near normal. Uh, and you're right, we saw a ridership declines of some 80% or more in some cases. You know, our rail systems across the U.S., for example, were hit even harder than that. Commuter rail operations down, say, 90%. What we have seen is through the efforts of the industry, both to address some of the initial concerns, which were really around health and safety, making sure uh, the mask wearing was occurring, making sure that hygiene and cleanliness of vehicles and surfaces on vehicles was done properly and really at a really robust level. All of those things are in place and have been in place now for the last almost two years. Um, and what we've seen is that the agencies are coming back relative to ridership, but it's a slow, slow process. You know, last year we were thinking it would take at least a couple of years. There's no doubt it's going to take two years or more to get us back anywhere near the pre-pandemic level. One of the things that's been so helpful here in the States has been the fact that we were able to bring to the table some $70 billion of emergency relief money for COVID. And the significance of that is that our agencies have been able to maintain their operations, even in spite of the lower ridership, uh, which is essential for, for those workers that had to get to their jobs to provide for our life support, uh, but also uh, providing them the means to be able to take a step back and think about the future, think about how they would reposition their systems and the like. What we have found is that up until the fall, about October, we had uh, inched back to about 63 percent of the pre-pandemic levels in terms of national ridership. We were making good progress. Omicron had something to say as it stepped in, and we saw that employers were very reluctant then to set their employers back to the back the employees back to their offices, and they kind of took a pause on that. So that has had a dampening effect in terms of getting people back in full force uh, into their offices from the remote environments. What we're now seeing is that those ridership trends are beginning to inch up, but it's slow. And until our cities really open up, until employees get back to their offices in much larger numbers than what we've seen over the last two years, uh, that will continue to just uh, limp along and be a, a slow process. But we're seeing that happen. I think that in our cities and our major employers are beginning to say we want our employees back in the office, at least at least on a hybrid schedule uh, because of collaboration and all what it takes in terms of thinking through an organization's challenges. And, you know, there, I, there really is no substitute in my mind for doing that face-to-face uh, -face for the most part. So we will see as that those trends take hold, uh, that transit will begin to 
garner back some of that ridership that we have lost. Now, whether that means it ever gets back to the full level is an unknown. We'll, we'll see that. But I think the positive here is that agencies are really taking aggressive measures in terms of refashioning their services. Uh, and I, I think, as you know as well, with the passage of the new Infrastructure and Investment Act, which happened last November, uh, we are seeing two key emphasis areas that the federal government has provided for in this new funding. And that is looking at our investments from an equity standpoint and looking at climate change and the issues of environment. Both of those play very favorably to transit and speak well to the future of more bus service, refashioned service, and services that really meet the needs of of the consumer and the rider. So those are a couple of things that I think will play uh, to the favor of transit as we go forward. Uh, It's hard to say again whether we will reach 100% of that ridership level in the next two or three years. But I think the the trends will be upward. uh, And with the new funding uh, that will be available here shortly for the industry, I think we will see new innovation, new services um, delivered uh, to the riding public and and, uh, prospects, I think, of, of really getting the industry back on its feet. I agree. I think we also may see um, with flex work arrangements, people questioning whether or not they need 2.5 vehicles. So I think you might end up with it with a new demographic of riders out of it as all as well. So I think there's there's a lot of change and interesting um, innovation going on. You know, it's interesting to say I, I, I would agree with that. And one other point I would make, certainly we're in an environment right now where we've seen gasoline prices, at least in the States, uh, double. Uh, in in the space of the last uh, six to nine months, uh, if that continues, matched with the high costs of both acquiring an automobile and even used cars, if you've seen some of the reporting on that, I think people will begin to take a hard look and say the transit alternative is a good one, especially in in households where you have you know two or more individuals who are working. Uh, they may own an automobile, uh, but having two uh, may be a bit much, uh, and so the public transit alternative is a good one. Agreed. So the transition to EV, or what NFI calls the Zevolution, is well underway with many cities, states, and countries having established targets for public transit to be zero emission by 2035 or 2040. And you know me, I'm a, I'm a math nerd. So that is what, uh, 13 to 15 years, which is one replacement cycle from now for a transit bus. Um, Do you think these are achievable targets? And what challenges do you think uh, public transit agencies face in this journey to a full zero emission fleet? Well, first, I would say that we are very pleased with the stance this this administration, the Biden administration, has taken very clearly in support and recognizing the perils of climate change and what we have to do as a global population, but also individual countries. And so we're getting very clear messaging, very clear public policy support in terms of the importance of climate. As I mentioned a moment ago, uh, transit sits in a very good place because we are part of that solution. Uh, not the only solution, but part of that solution to address climate change. The goals that have been laid out um, across the U.S. Uh, vary. You know, some states are very aggressive, others less so. Um, I think those overall are aggressive targets, but they're achievable in my mind. They are achievable because once and for all, we have matched funding availability to to give uh, added incentive to make those investments. You know, transit agencies, by and large, have always had to think about, can they afford, you know, the next level of transit investment, a new technology, a new bus. This gives them a level of confidence that with the federal funding that's there, they can be more aggressive. Uh, Heretofore, it's been a situation where an agency wants to show uh, that it is looking to the future and, you know, buying a bus or two or three to test the technology. I think this is now a different ballgame, looking at really what it means to develop a fleet. Uh, that that matches the the goals. And so, yes, these are aggressive targets, no doubt. Uh, We're not going to be able to do them easily, but I think that there are a number of of factors in play here uh, that are going to help us along the way. And I would say that it is achievable, uh, but we're going to really have to put our efforts forward to help make this happen as an industry public and private sector working closely together. The private sector develops the solutions. The public sector, as you know, are making some of the 
the everyday decisions about procurements and such. And I think there needs to be a, an understanding there uh, and more, more communication about how together to achieve these. But I'm optimistic. And you also mentioned a little bit earlier that, um, that the current service transportation bill requires a zero emission transition plan. And I think that planning piece of it is absolutely critical to, to hitting those targets. So I'm, I'm really encouraged as well. But last November at, at COP26, a number of the new commitments were made, including, um, and, I, and I agree, the, the current um, administration is very, very supportive. President Biden's commitment to reducing U.S. emissions by 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels by 2030 or eight years from now is half a transit bus replacement cycle from now. So you know, that is even more aggressive than than what we have out there from, from public transit agencies. How can private industry help accelerate this transition? The general sentiment expressed by the UN is that the commitments made are just barely enough to limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. So are there things that we can do to actually even speed up that transition? You know, I think I think you've touched on a big challenge here. Uh, first of all, those of us who are in this industry in some fashion, we're talking now the scientists, we're talking about the the manufacturers, uh, the public policy people, recognize climate change as a very significant, daunting issue for the world, and certainly here in the states as well. However, when you move it down to the everyday person uh, that's more concerned about how they're putting food on the table for their families, how they're paying their health care costs, I don't know that necessarily that they take climate change as an overarching critical issue. And so I think we have a collective charge, a collective effort to help educate and, quite frankly, to market what's what's happening. Um, and in that regard, what I'd say is I think there's a closer collaboration that's needed, public and private sector, uh, to, to begin to get information out about what's happening and what some of the benefits are. You know, we've seen now around the country in the U.S. a number of systems that have kind of taken that step forward, whether it be battery electric vehicles or in some cases, hydrogen fueled cell buses. Uh, those are wonderful innovations that the private sector, like a new flyer, is developing. Um, we need to bring attention to those that this is what's happening today. Uh, these are the benefits that we are deriving and will derive as a city, as a community. I don't know that we do as good a job as we can about those. So uh, in one way, I think we can bring more attention to them, highlight them, uh, begin to get information out to the public about what is happening. Uh, and I think that we all share some, some amount of responsibility for that. Uh, I think the education piece and the marketing pieces are really what we have to step up, the storytelling of what is happening. Again, we're close to it. We see what's happening every day. The general public, by and large, is not because that's not what, what, they're, what they're really um, uh, doing every day. But uh, I think that's a key piece of it that we, that we have to do, keep educating and sharing information. Uh, I think, again, the, the, um, the funding that's been made available at the federal level gives us an opportunity to talk about the funding and the policy policies around that. You know, as in most issues, money alone isn't going to solve the challenges or the issues that we have before us. But when you have good policy, sound policy to do that, it's, I think that we can we can really move the ball uh, significantly. So it's, it's helping educate, helping change people's minds and perspectives uh, of what's possible uh, and, and how our future can be better. Quite frankly, uh, if we, uh, as a as a, both a country and as a as a world, begin to do some of these things that we know have to be addressed, I completely agree with you. I think that the policy today is is very supportive, and the funding is there. Um, I think that maybe the message that we need to get out is is one of urgency. You know, nature doesn't work like you can do nothing up to the point of 2050, and then a whole bunch of actions, and then avoid. Um, global warming. It doesn't work that way. It actually has to happen earlier in order to have that chance of success. So, uh, so I think I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to tell some stories about the urgency uh, related to uh, to climate change and and engage people so that they act with that policy framework and that funding availability. Well, that's where I think, again, uh, working together, public and private sectors really need to have a, a game plan here to address that. Human nature being what it is, we both touched on it, uh, we tend to push things off until we see the critical 
happenings. And of course, in the U.S., we've seen, and really across the world, we've seen disasters here the last couple of, of years of natural disasters, whether they're wildfires that have swept our states uh, or hurricanes and tornadoes. These are the effects in large measure of climate change. And, and it's having people connect those dots that sometimes uh, they don't see that relationship that we need to be talking about. So the link between the scientists and our industry and the policymakers, uh, we ought to be talking with one another and seeing how best we can put forward our ideas and our programs uh, to get the education, get the messaging out. I agree. You know, we are at such a unique moment in history right now. Um, I believe at APTA Expo last November, you called the new surface transportation bill a once in a generation opportunity. And I completely agree. Um, and I'm really excited to, for NFI Group and all subsidiaries to work alongside APTA to, to make these things happen. So I guess on, on behalf of Paul Subri and the leadership team at NFI Group and all of our businesses, I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you for joining us today and, and sharing your perspectives and expertise. It's it's really a very exciting time. And Jennifer, it's my pleasure. And, and let me take the occasion to thank you and the team at, at New Flyer and New Flyer Industries for what you do on behalf of our public transportation industry. I know firsthand of the technological innovations that you're bringing forward. Uh, those will make a difference. And you're right. Uh, we feel very strongly that we're in a moment in time that's extraordinarily exciting in terms of the opportunities to really build public transportation the way it needs to be built here in the States, to expand it, to improve it. Uh, and what you deliver in terms of the bus technologies uh, are, are so critical and fu fundamental to that. So we're looking forward to working with you. Uh, we've got lots to do uh, and, and exciting times ahead. Thank you.